Okay, thank you, Chanel. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for signing up for this. We have uh, almost 350 people participating. And thank you to the New York Association for Independent Living for co-sponsoring this for NIL members. So today, uh-oh, wait a minute, Chanel. Oh, let's see. Okay, this, it wasn't working. So today is part one. We're gonna be reviewing the basics of what are supplemental needs trusts, the different types of trusts, talking about using them for eliminating the Medicaid spend down, go over some myths about, about trusts. And today we'll be focusing on what expenses may be paid by a trust. And that's regardless of whether you're using it for assets or for income for Medicaid. That's an important part of planning of how someone is going to use a trust to decide whether it's practical for them. And we will be talking about some differences between trusts and ABLE accounts in that discussion. A preview of part two, which is on November 15th, we will then move, now that you've had the basics, to using SNTs when your client receives a lump sum or if they have excess resources and are applying for a benefit. And you'll, we'll be re reviewing in, in detail the impact of transferring a lump sum into an SNT and other options for planning with lump sums, like spending it down or um, transferring it elsewhere. And we'll review it for different benefits. So, um, if you haven't already registered for that part two, um, please do so because the way GoToWebinar works, it's a separate webinar, so you need to register for that separately to get that link. And that's true whether or not you paid for this webinar. Okay, so please click on that link for part two. This PowerPoint, though, covers both presentations. So what is a supplemental needs trust? It's a type of a trust that supplements public benefits. So the name says, says, says a lot. It's designed to supplement and not replace different government public benefits. So in fact, language in the trust must prohibit the trustee from spending the trust funds in any way that would impair the beneficiary's eligibility for public benefits. And it can't duplicate what the benefit is about. And we'll review that when we talk about what expenses the trust can pay. A supplemental needs trust must be irrevocable. You can't temporarily park the inheritance in a trust for a certain amount of time and then decide to take it out and give it all away to your nieces and nephews. It has to be irrevocable. In nature of a trust, there are always three parties to a trust. There is a donor, and that's not like a donor in charity. It's a donor of the funds whose funds are being used to set up the trust. And we'll talk about different types of trusts and different types of donors. There's the trustee who is charged with the responsibilities set forth in the trust agreement, which is to spend the trust funds in a way that's provided for in the agreement and that does not hurt the, the person's eligibility for benefits. They also have other responsibilities in managing the funds, investing it, doing reports, paying taxes, things like this. The third party of a trust is the beneficiary. So that's the person for whom the trust funds are being spent. Another requirement of a supplemental needs trust is that the beneficiary must be found disabled, even if they are 100 years old. It seems counterintuitive that someone at 100 would need to prove that they are disabled, but that's the rules. And 
the definition of disability for purposes of, of an SNT is that it's the same definition as used by the Social Security Administration in determining eligibility for Social Security disability insurance or for SSI. The rules do get less strict the older you are so that there are special rules for people age 72 and over that make it easier to qualify as disabled. Now, Social Security uses all those rules to determine eligibility for SSD and SSI, but some of our clients are, would like to use trusts when they're over 65, such as those using a pool trust for sheltering income for Medicaid. So they would not have been found disabled um, unless they received Social Security disability before they turned 65. So in that case, the Medicaid program can determine that the client is disabled. And that's a whole uh, series of procedures and forms. We're not going to take the time to go through all of it now, but we have all the forms and a great article online that takes you through that. It's called the sequential evaluation of disability. We may be scheduling another training on that, but that's not really covered today. So let's start looking at the different types of trust. First way we can divide them into, into groups are a third party trust versus a first party trust. So a first party trust is also called a self-settled trust. And the main difference is whether the trust funds have to be paid back to Medicaid when the beneficiary dies. If there are still funds left in the trust, do they have to be paid back? So for a first party self-settled trust, the answer is yes. Any money left in the trust at the beneficiary's death must be used to pay back the state for the cost of Medicaid services paid during the beneficiary's lifetime. There's an alternative with pool trust. The federal law uh, wants to encourage nonprofits to operate pool trust, so they allow the nonprofit to keep the principal left in the trust when the beneficiary died and use it for the benefit of other people with disabilities. But from the client's point of view, it's the same. They do not get the money. Um, they can't go to their uh, heirs when they die. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. Um, you know, if there's so much money in the trust that there's money left when um, after Medicaid is paid back, then that can go to heirs. And some pool trusts um, require such a high balance that um, they might provide in their contract that, that some of the money left um, can go to heirs, but that's very, it varies very much by trust and you have to look at the terms of the trust. A third party trust is one that's set up by someone who is not legally responsible for the beneficiary, a relative, a friend, an estate. Uh, someone says in the will, I want to leave a supplemental needs trust for my nephew or for my son who's age 40 and is disabled. So in that case, um, the third party is the donor of the money. And uh, they're setting up this trust. In that case, there is no payback requirement at death. And the trust may provide who, for who, who are this, the beneficiaries who would receive the money um, if there's anything left when the primary beneficiary dies. So back on the self-settled trust, it can be a little confusing because remember we said there were three parties to a trust. There's a donor, a beneficiary, and the trustee. So in a first party trust, the donor and the beneficiary are the same person. I am setting up my own supplemental needs trust with my own money 
because I received an inheritance and I am the beneficiary. So that's different than a third party trust. Now, big strategy tip. If a parent of adult disabled child wants to leave them money in their will, it is so much better for them to set up a third party trust in their will or during their the parent's lifetime because that won't have any payback requirement. If they leave money to the child directly in the will or if they die without a will and the child inherits by the rules of intestacy when people die without a will, then the child has inherited money and it's their money. So they must put it into a first party self-settled SNT and that will have a payback requirement. Very important planning rule. So how does an SNT work? The donor, the person whose money it is, is establishing the SNT, they execute a trust agreement or put the trust in their will. In a pool trust, the donor and beneficiary can be the same person and whoever is the donor is signing a joinder agreement to join the master trust. But there are also third party pool trusts, which we will talk about. So they establish the trust, which is a contract. They either create their own new trust or join a pool trust. Then there's the transfer of income or assets into the trust. So assets can be transferred into a trust. It could be a personal injury settlement, an inheritance, just excess savings that and the client needs to spend down their assets in order to qualify for a benefit or they can shelter income for Medicaid and eliminate the spend down. There is no other government benefit that allows depositing income to make it invisible so it's not counted for eligibility. Only Medicaid, we get that question all the time because people think, oh, this is fun. Now I can just put in all my money, my social security income into a pool trust and now I can get SSI. No, you can't. You cannot do that for SSI, for SNAP, for Section 8, for any other benefit. Medicaid is the only one that allows it and that's only community Medicaid, not nursing home Medicaid. We'll talk about more that more too. The trustee then invests and maintains the assets. They have to file tax returns. Um, they have to do accountings and they make expenditures on behalf of the beneficiary. Okay. So then we have two different types of trusts, individual SNTs and pool trusts. So what do they have in common? Both of these types of trusts can be established by the person who will, the, the beneficiary, the person who will, will be benefiting from, from the trust or their parent or their grandparent or their legal guardian or by a court order. Let's say there's a big personal injury settlement and the court establishes the trust. Now this is fairly new. Before 2016, an individual with a disability was not allowed to establish their own individual SNT. They could only use a pool trust unless they had a parent, a grandparent, a guardian, or went to court and got a court order to establish the trust. And that just shows a, a very patronizing view of disabilities that was in the law when it was passed 
not that long ago. I think this is about 20 years old, this law. So um, we can thank the Elder Law Bar and, and a lot of disability rights groups for passing the 21st Century Cures Act that changed this so that an individual under age 65 may establish their own individual supplemental needs trust or join a pooled trust without having to have their mother sign the papers for them. It was particularly insulting because it was still their money, but they couldn't actually sign the, the trust forms. So now that's, that's really, um, you know, move that up to modern times. So both SNTs and pool trusts, when I individual SNTs, allow for deposit of surplus income to eliminate the Medicaid spend down or excess assets or lump sums. But if the person is age 65 or over, she may only use a pool trust to deposit either excess income from Medicaid or excess assets. She's not allowed to use an individual SNT. If she already had an SNT open and was using it, it's fine. She can still spend down that money and request expenditures from the trust, but she can't put new income or assets in after age 65. I've heard a myth, there's a lot of people have a misunderstanding because they've heard of pooled income trusts, sometimes abbreviated PITs, and they think that only a pooled income trust can be used to deposit income to eliminate the Medicaid spend down. But that's just not true. It's true that the pooled trust is most commonly used um, for, for people who aren't depositing you know, a large amount of assets into a trust, but you can also use an individual SNT to a deposit excess income to eliminate the spend down. And which expenses may be paid by the trust is the same for both. Whether you're using an individual SNT under the age of 65 or you're using a pool trust, those rules are the same, which we're going to talk about soon. Now, we talked about how individual and pool trusts are the same. Let's look at some of the differences. So who is the trustee? In an individual trust, you can appoint anyone to be the trustee. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a lawyer or a bank. Uh, so that does allow for a lot more flexibility. Let's say you need a new winter coat and you and your friend is the trustee. So you can go shopping with your friend and the friend could use a check from the trust uh, to, to buy the coat. Whereas with a pool trust, the trustee is a nonprofit organization. Examples are NYSARC, or the Center for Disability Rights, but there are many more, and there is, are lists of pool trusts. Um, links will be in, an, in a later slide. There's probably 20 or 30 pool trusts. So you have a little less flexibility. They're not gonna go shopping with you for the coat. Um, you have to submit a, uh, an expenditure request to them, or sometimes they will reimburse. What's an age limit? For, as we said before, for an individual SNT, the individual must be under age 65 when the money is deposited, but they may continue to spend it after. Whereas a pool trust can be used for someone of any age, including people age 65 plus. There are people under 65 who might still prefer to use a pool trust because it's just easier to join. You don't, um, and the next, the next line is, uh, do you need an attorney to establish these trusts? For an individual SNT, generally you do need a lawyer because different counties have set up some different requirements for what specific language they require in a SNT. So it's good to have a lawyer who's familiar with the local requirements. 
um, and make sure that the language is correct. There's also the trust needs to have its own um, tax ID number, and it needs a bank account. Uh, you know, there's a number, the trustee has to be trained to do accountings and how to administer it. So it's a little more complicated, so you might need a lawyer. With a pool trust, you do not need a lawyer. There's a standard form, and the trust use a joinder agreement to join the trust. And the trustee does all the administration. And then we talked about uh, this before, that the funds remaining at the time of the beneficiary's death, in an individual SNT, there's that Medicaid payback for the cost of services provided, uh, whereas with the pooled SNT, pooled trust, there's still a Medicaid payback. Um, well, there, there's something comparable to the Medicaid payback in that the money stays in the trust in lieu of it being paid back to Medicaid. And the trust do vary some because some of the pooled trusts require a certain amount of money, a threshold amount, before they will accept you and the trust, some of them require $100,000 be deposited. Um, the list of pool trusts will show the differences. So that's where when they're requiring so much money, there might be some variation that you could leave some of it to go to heirs after you die. So let's just summarize the rules we've talked about so far. Um, So you could see on this grid, there's 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 two kinds of trust in terms of who's the donor. There's a first party trust and a third party trust. And then there's two kinds of trust in terms of who's the trustee. And that's an individual SNT and a pool trust. And all of them, all so there are really four different combinations and you can use them all except that there are these limitations about age so an individual snt yes you can use it for income for medicaid but only under 65 and yes you can use it to deposit assets but only under 65. whereas a pool trust you can do it at all ages. If you're putting assets into a pool trust over 65, however, and we will talk about this, you have to really think about that that transfer of assets will trigger a transfer penalty for nursing home care. And there's also a penalty for SSI. That will be covered in part two with the lump sum planning. But that's a a heads up about that. Now with a third party trust, can you deposit income into the trust to get rid of the Medicaid spend down? No. So if you have a third party trust, Uncle Lou has set up a trust for you with, with assets and now you have a spend down and you want to deposit um, excess income, you must establish, establish a separate first party trust. It might seem silly, and I have seen people m make mistakes with this because they think an SNT is an SNT, but they are not. So I hope this grid is helpful for you. Um, And can the individual deposit assets into a third party trust? Well, only the assets of the third party. If the beneficiary now comes into an inheritance or something or wins a lawsuit, they can't just add their assets to a third party trust because the rules are different. We went over that before because of the Medicaid payback. There will be a Medicaid payback for the beneficiary if they're putting their own funds into a trust, but there's no Medicaid payback for the third party trust. So I think 
we're going to try a little poll. Oh, I don't know if you could see this. Poll must be close, enable screen sharing. Oh dear, I think the poll might might not work because I don't know how to use. Oh, you guys are responding. All right, so you can see it, but I can't. Okay. So Lee received SSD and set up an individual trust for assets and surplus income. She's turning 65. So she's, she had a surplus income before. She has a spend down with Medicaid and she'll still have it when she's 65. What are her options? Okay. Oh, everybody's doing great responding. So 28% up, oh, it's going up. All right, people are still voting. All right. All right, about half half of you have voted. Well, we'll wait another minute while everybody's voting. Feels like yesterday with election day. All right, so far the most votes are for the third answer that she must open a pool trust for income. This is weird, I can't fully read it. But may continue to keep the, the existing S&T open and spend it down. A few people said she has to spend all the money in the trust before she turns 65. And so far, about 36% of the people said since the SNT was already open, she may still put her spend down into the individual SNT. Okay, so this is a very important takeaway from this seminar. Is about 43% of the people who have responded are wrong. <laughs> So, so you need to um, get this right. Answer three is correct. She, if she wants to continue depositing her spend down into a, an SNT, she must open a new trust and it must be a pooled trust. But she can keep her income that she's already deposited and any asset she's deposited in the existing SNT. And she can, that trustee can still spend money to benefit her. So she would have two trusts, but that's absolutely essential. Okay, about three quarters of the people have voted. Uh, so hope you all got that. The answer is number three. All right, so we're going to go over a few. All right, we're done with that. All right, powers of attorney. We said before that an individual could establish their own supplemental needs trust or can join a pool trust. What if that individual lacks capacity? and they executed a power of attorney in the past. So this is a hot topic because in July, 2017, the New York City Medicaid program issued a policy that said no can do, cannot use a power of attorney to enroll in a pool trust or set up an individual trust if that power of attorney was signed after September 2009 
and if it lacks a statutory gift writer. So a statutory gift writer was an addition to the power of attorney law in New York State back in September 2009. And if a power of attorney is going to give the agent under the power of attorney authority to make gifts, which includes any transfers of assets, you need a statutory gift writer. And that writer, if we were not looking at the form right now, but the form of the gift writer has a blank for, I hereby authorize my agent to make gifts as follows, colon, and there's a blank. HRA will reject that writer, even if it's signed and witnessed, unless it also says in that blank, I specifically authorize the agent to establish a supplemental needs trust. So for a while, we were fighting with HRA on this, and then this past February, the State Department of Health made this policy statewide in this GIST directive, a GIS directive. Now, all of these directives and the HRA directive are in the article posted on our website that goes through each and every law and state and local city directive about supplemental needs trust. So you can find this all here. So the state of the law right now is, you have to look at that power of attorney. If it's dated after September, 2009, and if it lacks a statutory gift writer, I would not submit it. I would, I would look to see if the individual has capacity to sign a new, if they have to sign a new joinder agreement themselves, or if they or to just sign a new power of attorney and if so they should do so and it must have this gift writer and it must have this language now the state is letting them make that amended joinder agreement um or or okay sorry um then with the new power of attorney the agent then executes an amended joinder agreement under the authority of the new POA. So that all has to be done, submitted to the trust. And then the trust amends its approval of the trust and all of that is submitted to your local DSS to, that you submitted the trust to. If all of that is done properly, they will approve it retroactively. But the big question is, what if the client does now lack capacity and cannot sign a new one? I mean, as, though, as, as it stands now under their policy, a guardianship may be required. Now, the State Bar Association Elder Law Section has taken a stand on this, asking the state to revoke this requirement. And you can download that letter if you want to see the legal argument for why this gift writer should not be required. There's also an article by Dan Fish in the New York Law Journal. All of these are posted in this directive if you want more information on that. So we're hoping that there'll be some movement from the state on that. I wouldn't hold your breath. Um, so in the meantime, the, this is the workaround to use. And this is both for an individual s and or a pool trust. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with the mouse. So now we're going to talk a little bit about pooled income trusts. But this it's the same thing we're talking about applies to individual supplemental needs trusts when they are used to deposit excess income. Now, why do you need to use a pooled trust? So here's a little Medicaid budgeting 101 with medicaid for people who are disabled aged 65 plus or blind the budgeting methodology does not care about how much rent they have to pay the only deductions from gross income are the medicare part b premium 
and any the cost of any other health insurance premiums. Here, there's a, in this example, there's a Medigap premium, but maybe the person is dental, maybe they're paying um, for a vision, maybe they're paying a premium for a Medicare Advantage plan. You can't deduct uh, premiums that are being paid by the government. So if they're in a Part D plan, if they're on Medicaid, the government is paying for a chunk of their premium. So you have to see if if how much of the premium might not be paid. It's over something called the benchmark rate. And then a whopping $20 disregard, which hasn't changed in the 40 years of, of this kind of budgeting. So Medicaid says, we only allow you to have $8.59 a month after we take these deductions. So Medicaid says your surplus income or your spend down is $424. Now this person's rent is a thousand. And we know it's tough to live in New York, anywhere in the state on $1,600 a month when thousand dollar rent is considered low. So how is this supposed to, and so if we, we hear all the time, people go to a fair hearing about this and sorry, um, Medicaid doesn't care. So the pooled income trust allows the person who is elderly or disabled to deposit their spend down amount into the trust every month. Again, this could be a supplemental needs trust if the person is under 65 and that deposit is excluded from being counted as income. It's magic, it's a wonderful thing um, and it, it doesn't exist for any other benefit. And by eliminating the spend down, they don't have to spend down their money on, on the medical bills or pay it in. And then the trustee can use their money to pay their living expenses, to pay that rent of $1,000. Now, another big misunderstanding people have is that they've enrolled in the trust. They've signed up, they've paid the initial fees, the trust has sent their approval and they think that's it. But that is only step one. Next, they must submit the trust and many other documents to Medicaid to approve it and to re-budget the income. So here's that same person now re-budgeted with the pool trust. So they're contributing $424.50 to the trust. They're putting in their entire spend down. And now what is their spend down? Zero. It's the same budget above. Now a few practical tips here in determining how much income to deposit in, into the pool trust. You can help your client a lot by suggesting that they add $135.50 to their deposit and that would make them eligible for the Medicare savings program in which the state takes over paying their Medicare Part B premium. So what, what does that mean? Normally, the Part B premium is deducted out of the Social Security check before the client receives it. So they, they never even see it. They don't, they don't even know that their real gross benefit is 135.50 more. So by adding that deposit, extra deposit into the trust, you have now given them uh, enrollment into the MSP program, and now their check will go up by 135.50. There are fees for using the pool trust. So in most cases, the $135.50 will more than compensate for any fee. So it eliminates any out-of-pocket costs on an ongoing basis after the initial enrollment fees of, of enrolling in a pool trust. So in this case, she'd increase the contribution from $424.50, add $135.50, and she'd contribute $560. And that way, the Medicare Part B premium would no longer be deducted. Now, 
this is 2019, the Part B premium will probably go up in 2020. So you'll want to pay attention to that and, and adjust um, your deposits. So let's look at the buzz budget. So remember before we deducted both the Medigap premium and the Medicare Part, Part B, right? And we came out with a zero budget. Now we're only going to deduct the Medigap premium because she can't deduct the Medicare Part B premium if it's no longer being taken out of her Social Security check. So normally that would give her a higher excess income. Her spend down is in fact going up to 560, but she's increasing her contribution to the trust to 560. So her spend down is still zero and you've saved her 135.50. We make a very happy client. And it's a good pitch to convince clients to do this. They're often resistant to using pooled trusts. It's scary. Um, they're giving up some control of their money. And this, this is an added benefit. Some other strategies to think about besides the Medicare savings program. Uh, you might want to think about if the rent is higher than the spend down, as a practical matter, it might be better to increase the deposit so the trust can pay the full rent. Otherwise, the trust can only pay what you've deposited after deducting its monthly fee. So then you or the family member, whoever's helping with the rent, has to pay it separately. That could be fine for many people, but for some people or for some landlords, um, they might prefer to be in one. So in this case, her rent was a thousand. Instead of contributing 560 to the trust, it might be better for her to deposit 1000 plus add on whatever the fee is. So if it was the Center for Disability Rights Trust, which has a, a fixed fee of $20 a month, you'd de deposit 1020 they take their 20 and pay the rent of 1,000. Other trusts have a sliding scale based on how much you're depositing. So you'd um, calculate it that way. That's another strategy. Another strategy is, especially now that we're approaching the end of the year, put a little extra in to cover the cost of living adjustment expected for next year's income. Even $5 or $10 extra. So this prevents a, a, a sort of a, a, a real administrative uh, nightmare that the next year they have a cost of living adjustment. So their income goes up by six bucks and their spend down goes up by six bucks even though the Medicaid income level will probably go up too, let's say they still they will now have a spend down and they didn't have one before. So if this is somebody who's paying in or is uh, you know being billed by their managed long-term care plan for the spend down, they really might prefer not to have any spend down. So by just depositing a little more than their spend down, uh, you can eliminate that hassle. The other uh, guideline for figuring out how much to deposit is don't deposit more than the client can spend. If you let principal accumulate and the client goes into the nursing home permanently, then the income deposited into the trust after they were age 65 and that has accumulated and has not been spent is considered a transfer of assets and is subject to a transfer penalty. Now, this is my, I'll get on my soapbox for, um, you know, those of us in legal services who, you know, where the clients need every penny of what they're being put into the pool trusts. Um, 
for their basic living expenses. But there are people using this trust who, you know, have have quite high income and their living expenses are just not as high. So you don't have to reduce the spend down to zero. Let's say someone would have a $5,000 spend down, but they don't need all of their income to meet their, their expenses and to live comfortably. So you could deposit 4,000 into the trust and they'd still have a $1,000 spend down and they can pay it. They can afford to pay that toward the cost of their care. That way they're not worried about a transfer penalty later if the money has accumulated. Uh, so that's that's some advice to people representing people with, with higher incomes. The two steps for setting up the pool trust is very basically, we're not going into the details on it, is to sign this joinder agreement. Uh, and we talked about the power of attorney before. Once the trust has approved it, submitting it the whole package to the local Medicaid agency. And here's where the proof of disability comes in and that they are very strict on that. If the person's over 65, they need to prove disability. Even if they're under 65, if they're not getting SSD, they need to prove disability. You need to attach HIPAA releases and you need a verification of deposits known as a VOD to show that the client is actually putting their income in. Many people join the trust and then they don't put their spend down in. It is just going through motions with absolutely no benefit unless you can show that the spend down is actually being put in. So we are not going through that whole process in detail. Again, we might set up another training on it. There is an old um, webinar online on these on one of these sites um, where David Silva did it, um, but we, we do plan on updating that um, and we'll send everybody a notice if we do. But now we're going to go on to the next uh, thing and I'm just looking to see if there are questions and oh i think there is a question about using it for the msp but i think i've already answered that all right well we'll we'll look at those later So it's it's key when you're deciding how to use an SNT, whether you're using a pool trust to shelter income or whether you're planning on putting a lump sum in, you have to look at what expenses are you expecting the trust to pay. And for that, you need to know what benefits is the client receiving? Because the answer to this question is different for each and every benefit. You cannot assume that the trust can pay the client's rent because that's going to vary with, uh, that's not true. It's true for Medicaid, but it's not true for all the other benefits, at least not without. Oh, I do not know what's wrong with having trouble. Okay. So number one rule, the trust so the trustee can never give the beneficiary cash. That's true for all programs. It's absolutely not allowed. The trust expenditures must be primarily for the benefit of the beneficiary so that you can't buy a wedding gift for someone. They can't pay, the, the grandmother can't pay for her, her grandson's college. Uh, Sometimes they can pay expenses for others um, when they're primarily for the beneficiary's benefit. We'll go over that. Sometimes they'll re reimburse someone else who bought the beneficiary that winter coat we talked about. And each trust has rules for under what circumstances they'll do that. Don't assume they will. 
call the trust in advance and you know explain that uh, you're going shopping for a winter coat and get an assurance that they'll reimburse re reimburse you for buying the coat. The, generally, what the trust does is makes third-party in-kind payments. They pay the rent directly to the landlord. They pay a roommate if there's a roommate agreement. Um, they pay bills directly to con the electric company, to the cable company. They can also pay a credit card, but they'll make sure that the charges on the card are acceptable, and we'll go through that. It's different for every program. So this slide gives the general overall rules and then we will go in more detail about it. There's also a PDF posted on, on the, the, um, the GoToWebinar that is a longer version of this chart and that is taken from our large manual or outline on SNTs that you all received a link for. So just Generally, as we said, um, can't give cash, including debit cards or gift cards. Um, I guess there are some types of gift or debit cards that are restricted that some pool trusts might give, but um, that that's very individual to the trust and to the type of card. They're special. They're not just regular gift cards. You buy at uh, CVS. Shelter costs. Most people, their biggest expense are shelter costs, their rent, their mortgage, their maintenance. So the rules vary, all right? The TA stands for temporary assistance or, HASA, or also the HASA, which is the HIV AIDS Service Administration. Temporary assistance is cash, public assistance. A trust cannot pay those shelter costs or dollar for dollar, it will be counted as income because it's viewed as not supplementing, but replacing the, uh, the cash grant. So if the client's on public assistance, forget the plan that the trust can now pay rent with the lawsuit settlement that's been put in the trust, okay? If the client's on SSI, the trust may pay their rent, but it will reduce SSI by the lesser of, no, no, sorry, it's the greater of, this is wrong, correct this, oh, I'm not in editing mode, correct that to greater of, $257, which is one third of the federal benefit rate, or the actual cost. So let's say the shelter, the rent is $200 and the trust is paying the full rent, it's section eight. So the SSI check will go down $200. Let's say the rent is $800 and the trust is paying the full rent. The SSI check will go down $257, all right? With regular Medicaid, and when I say regular Medicaid, I mean non-MAGI Medicaid, which is a fancy way of talking about the Medicaid that I think most of the people on this call are accustomed to. It's Medicaid for age 65 plus, people who are disabled or blind, as opposed to the care, Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, which is for the younger population who are not on Medicare. So with this non-MAGI Medicaid, that's the great thing. Your client's putting money into a pool trust. Yes, the trust may make a direct payment of the rent or the mortgage or the maintenance to the landlord or the bank that holds the mortgage. Um, and it's it's fine. It is not considered income. It does not will not increase their spend down. And when I say rent, that means all of these costs, what are considered shelter costs, property taxes, heating fuel, gas, electric, water, sewer, all right? The last benefit here is SNAP, which is food stamps. Someone is using 
a trust, will the trust payment of rent affect their SNAP eligibility? Uh, it's fine if the trust pays their rent, but it will affect the amount of food stamps they get because normally uh, the calculation uh, for how much benefit someone gets deducts excess shelter costs. So if you no longer have excess shelter costs because the trust is paying them, it could reduce the amount of SNAP uh, food stamp benefits the person's getting. So that's shelter. Food, all right? You can see that for temporary assistance, public benefits, HASA, no is for everything. Shelter, food, clothing, cable, phone. All of these are considered regular benefits and I mean the, the benefits for which the temporary assistance grant is provided and you're not allowed to replace it. So none of those are allowed. For SSI, food is considered the same as shelter so that the trust cannot pay for a credit card that has charges for going out to a restaurant or for a grocery store on it without it being subject to this reduction. Again, it will reduce it by the actual contribution or up to 257. Maybe I will correct this right now. I apologize, great for that. Oh, I don't know why it's doing that. All right, sorry, but I don't know how to get rid of this. Oh, there we go, okay. For SSI, if the credit card contains charges for clothing, cable, phone, cell phone, internet, transportation, or if these bills, the cable bill, the phone bill, the cell phone bill are submitted, these are all fine. They will not reduce the SSI. So you really just want to keep in mind what the trust is and is not allowed to pay. Um, for non-MAGI Medicaid, it's the most liberal. And that's why, you know, when our clients are receiving Medicaid and they're over 65 or they're, they're disabled, it's very liberal of what the trust can pay. It can really pay for any of these as long as it's paying a direct payment. So that's why for, you know, using it for Medicaid is really the best. Again, non-MAGI Medicaid is the type of Medicaid used by people 65 or over or under 65 and who are disabled and have Medicare. And these bills are okay because Medicaid does not count in-kind income at all unless it's from legally responsible relatives. So that means the trustee of the trust or an adult child can pay the rent directly to a landlord and it's not counted as income. But if a spouse pays the rent, that's income because they're legally responsible. A child is never legally responsible for their parents, so if they pay the rent for the parent, it's fine, it doesn't count. But Medicaid is much more liberal than SSI and so again, payments by the trust to third parties for food or shelter are considered in-kind support and maintenance or ISM. 
and they reduce SSI by the lower of the actual value of the support provided or up to a maximum of one third of the federal benefit rate. So again, if the, the, most of the trust will pay credit cards, but they will not, they will scrutinize the bill. This is why you have to submit the bill with it to make sure they're not paying for these groceries or restaurant bills if the person's on SSI. If they're not on SSI, it's fine. They're on Medicaid, regular Medicaid. Now, because SSI will reduce, be reduced if the trust pays the rent, that doesn't mean you should never use a trust to pay rent. It's really a very case-by-case -case analysis. If the rent is very high, say it's $1,500, and there's $300,000 in the trust, you know, from a lawsuit settlement, then it could very well be worth taking a $257 reduction in the SSI check because there would be enough principal in the trust to subsidize the rent for the future. But if there's only $10,000 in the trust, then spending $1,500 a month um, and losing $257 a month on the SSI check is not a very sustainable way to go for the future. So that's probably not the best idea. A person's going to need a roommate or is going to have to move. So don't be dogmatic about it and say, oh, Valerie said that SSI will be reduced, so we can't pay rent from the trust. Really look at the particular situation and do a cost benefit analysis about whether whether it's worth it. So what can the trust pay for for SSI? Again, cable, phone, cell phone, internet, travel, entertainment, uh, account could be set up with the car service that would bill the trust monthly. Now that there's Uber, that could be put on the credit card and transportation would be fine. Also, if you're submitting credit card bills, the trusts are not allowed to pay a bill that has arrears on it. The, the card has to be paid up. And that's because the, uh, well, it's because the um, social security rules say so. And, but it's because the trust can't tell what are those arrears from. They may have been for paying a wedding for the daughter, and that's a gift, and that isn't allowed. Um, that's not for the primary benefit of the beneficiary. So the trust has to scrutinize the bill to make sure there's no gifts for third parties, no charges for food or shelter for SSI. Now, let's say someone, I, I said before, don't put more in a trust than you have um, expenses to, to, pay, to spend. One thing, if someone doesn't have a prepaid funeral agreement, we've actually had people who have some extra income enter into a installment contract with a funeral home and make an affordable monthly payment plan. And the trust can pay that because it's paying a third party vendor in kind. And that way, that's not won't be considered a transfer of assets if the person goes into a nursing home and they're paying expense that is going to be needed. Um, the trust may not pay funeral expenses after the beneficiary dies, so it's always good to take care of those before, either from excess assets or from excess income in this way. The sole benefit rule. These are some updates that were put in the POMS. When I say the POMS, that's the Program and Operations Manual. The sites for all this are in the outline that the invitation to this had the link to, and it's also elsewhere in this uh, PowerPoint that has all the links to um, the, the, the sites. So it was updated in 2018 to make it a little more liberal for when 
an expenditure is okay even if others receive a collateral benefit because it primarily benefits the beneficiary. So for example, the trust, a trust you know, that has a lot of money from a lawsuit settlement or something may buy a house that the beneficiary lives in even though others live in the house. Or they can buy a TV even though other family members watch the TV. Check the POMs directly for rules on cars. They go into a lot of detail on when the trust may buy a car, which we're not going into here. Also, there's companion services. Um, the POMs has clarified that the trust may pay a third party, who may even be a family member, to uh, be a companion for a disabled beneficiary or for a minor disabled child taking them to Disney World, taking a disabled beneficiary on vacation, um, and for incidental expenses of that companion. I mean, obviously, this is not going to be if you're just putting in a small spend down, but this is more things to think about if it's you're using it for a lump sum and some bigger ticket items that could um, you know, enhance the, the beneficiary's quality of life and that are allowed. Uh, and they're allowed for SSI, and they, they would also be allowed for non-MAGI Medicaid. For non-MAGI Medicaid, again, that's for people over 65 or on Medicare if they're under 65. Those Their rules can't be any stricter than the SSI rule. So all of this expansion of what is allowed expenditure for people on SSI would also apply for someone who is not on SSI but has Medicaid. So you might, if these are things that are relevant to your practice, you might want to take a look at the POMs. Again, all the sites are in the outline. Travel expenses of a third party to visit the beneficiary are allowed. So a sister lives in California and the beneficiary lives in New York and you need a monthly plane ticket, you know, that that could be allowed. And the level of proof needed uh, is in the POMs, but they really did liberalize these rules. So now we're going to talk a little bit about ABLE accounts because they're similar but different. Federal law established ABLE accounts as an alternative to SNTs for people who were disabled before age 26. So like an SNT, they may be set up by the beneficiary for themselves, or they may be set up by a parent or a legal guardian on the person's behalf. There's a maximum, maximum account balance of $100,000 that can be on balance at any time. So if money is going in and out, that's fine. That's just the maximum balance. The maximum deposit per year is $14,000, which is a, a total combined from any and all sources. So um, you always have to be aware of who else is putting money in to make sure that the maximum deposit stays under $14,000. The nice thing here is that the principal and interest is exempt as a resource for TA, temporary assistance, and that would also be, mean HASA and SNAP and SSI and Medicaid. And um, there, there are nominal fees on it. So what kind of expenses may an ABLE account pay? Well, you'll see a lot of these expenses are similar to an SNT, but there's one big difference here, and that's housing. And that's a key difference between what ABLE accounts can pay and what SNTs can pay for SSI recipients. So the SSI rules provide that may an SNT pay for rent and shelter. So we already talked about, yes, for an SSI recipient, it can pay, but the SSI will be reduced. Here's the big difference for people on SSI. 
the ABLE account can pay rent and it will not reduce SSI. So if there is an option of putting money into an ABLE account instead of or in addition to an SNT, it's important to use that for someone on SSI if one of the main expenses they need paid is their rent. Um, another nice thing is that you can transfer money from an SNT to an ABLE account so that the ABLE account can now pay the rent with no adverse impact on SSI. So let's say there was a $100,000 uh, lawsuit settlement or inheritance and it was put into a supplemental needs trust, pool trust or uh, individual trust, it doesn't matter, and the person's on SSI. You had to use an SNT because you can only put 14,000 a year into an ABLE account. So you could never have used, put 100,000 into an ABLE account. But you can transfer, you can have the trustee transfer 14,000 a year to the ABLE account. And let's say rent is 1,000 a month. That ABLE account can spend that down to 1,000, you know, 1,000 a month on rent and it will not reduce the the person's SSI. So I think for, for all of us, we need to get into the habit of asking um, when someone is on SSI, were they disabled before age 26? Because using an SNT with an ABLE account, uh, using them together could be a, a really important planning tool. So they are more restrictive in that only people who are disabled before age 26 can use them, while an SNT can be used by anyone with a disability of any age. Um, the payback rules are slightly different as well. For an SNT, the payback is to pay Medicaid for all expenses paid in the lifetime of the beneficiary. Whereas for the ABLE account, the payback is only for costs paid since the date the account was established. So that's another thing to keep in mind in figuring out how to use them together, um, SNT and ABLE account. There is that maximum on an ABLE account of a thousand a year and um, a maximum deposit a year. All right, so we talked before about people on public assistance or HASA for people with AIDS and AIDS, AIDS, or HIV. And we talked about how strict it is that it, the trust cannot supplement benefits provided for in the standard of need, which is really everything. So here are a few things that could be paid for education, medical expenses of all things, although if they're on Medicaid, um, it would have to be medical expenses not covered by Medicaid. Child care costs, expenses of a disabled beneficiary such as housekeeping aids, social workers, therapists, vocational rehab aids, and legal expenses. So if you were using a supplemental needs trust um, to shelter, say, a lump sum for someone on public assistance, you'd want to make sure that it is drafted so that expenditures are limited to these types of expenses. Otherwise, it could be considered um, available and could count as an asset. So it's, it's um, very tricky. Um, doing this for people on public assistance. Hopefully the settlement is enough so they could go off public assistance and just use um, Medicaid, which is, which is much better. Um, and of course, always looking to see whether an ABLE count is possible uh, to use instead. For SNAP, as we said before, um, direct payments by the SNT 
for rent or utilities are okay, they don't count as income. However, those expenses could no longer be used as a deduction from income for excess shelter expenses. If the uh, trust did pay any expenses to the household, such as reimbursement for an expense, they would count as, as income. So you would, even though you can do that for Medicaid, have do some reimbursement to a th the third party, you wouldn't want to do it for SNAP because you have the concept of household. So let's say the daughter took you shopping for a coat but she's in your SNAP household, you wouldn't want the trust to reimburse her for the coat um, because now that can count as income for the household. All right, section eight, what is a trust allowed to pay for? So here, the federal regulations, again, and these are, uh, full sites are in the, the, the big manual online, um, don't aren't really specific, but about what trust may pay for. But they do say that temporary, non-recurring, or sporadic income, including gifts, does not count as income for Section Eight. So that's your guide. Um, you don't want the trust paying for recurring expenses like rent. For someone on Section 8, uh, you would have to find other non recurring uh, expenses if you really want to, you know, steer clear of any, of any impact on whether, whether uh, the expenditures will count as income. And for Section 8, if you have more income, it means your rent goes up. You could consult someone who knows how Section 8 rent is calculated because maybe you're willing, maybe it's still worth accepting that um, with that calculation, um, but you, you have to be mindful of that. Now, let's say you put a lump sum in a trust for someone on Section 8. There was a First Circuit case that said if you withdrew principal, not earnings of family assets, um, it's not income. Um, the case held that withdrawal of trust assets from a personal injury settlement was not income. So that's first circuit, it's not the second circuit, but um, I mean, that's sort of unusual that you could actually take um, the principal you know, withdrawal of the trust assets from the settlement. Um, I'm not sure how they did that because the trust is irrevocable. All right, and that brings us to the, this is the um, part for next time. So let me see if I can figure out how to look at these questions. I don't know why it's so small. Okay, so I am, can a person who owns a co-op apartment or private house be eligible for a pool trust? Uh, yes. I think that the, that question is really asking more, are they eligible for the benefit you're seeking? So for example, for regular Medicaid, for non-MAGI Medicaid allows a senior or person with disability to own the home that they live in. Um, so that's, it's really not 
a question about trust. It's more a question about the benefit. Uh, so yes, and then the trust could pay the mortgage, could pay taxes on it, um, as long as they're not on SSI. I just, let's see. What is a turnaround time for a rebudgeting using a pooled income trust? And how does the client pay for services in the interim? Okay, that's a great question. I wasn't, you know, as you know, this training didn't go th all the way through uh, all of the strategies around doing pooled trust. That will be for another training. But there, in New York City, there is now a lawsuit settlement which I can circulate to people attending this training that says if the pool trust was submitted with the Medicaid application, that the whole kit and caboodle, the Medicaid application and the pool trust have to be approved within 90 days. And that's for someone where uh, they're over 65 so that the state must make a disability determination to decide if they're disabled. And that comes from federal regulations that say Medicaid applications have to be uh, processed in, in 90 days. So that's still a long time, 90 days, but frankly, we've seen trust take a lot longer. Um, so what I'd recommend there is if you're applying with the trust to submit the trust so that it locks HRA in on the 90 days, but then ask very clearly in the cover letter to say, meantime, please approve this case with a spend down so that Medicaid can be approved and the person can enroll in a managed long-term care plan or get immediate need or start activating Medicaid anyway with a spend down. Um, so that, that way you get sort of the best of both worlds. They have to process the trust in 90 days, but they would approve it earlier with the spend down. I can't promise that they'll do that. You really have to advocate for that but um, that's one strategy. Now, the question asked, well, what do you, how do you send the spend down to the trust and what are you supposed to do? Um, I mean, the trust can start paying your bills with that, but if you're billed for the spend down, you can't pay it. So like if a, a managed long-term care plan or a vendor is billing you for the spend down, you have to try to sweet talk them and say, look, we submitted a trust. You will be paid back. You will be make, we'll make sure it's retroactive. And I can assure you that I will monitor that notice to make sure the effective date is retroactive. And um, that way, the person um, sorry, uh, just trying to read these questions. Um, that way, the person can start receiving services. For both SSI and Medicaid, yes, um, the the you can own your own your own home, so that's not a barrier. Oh, the ABLE website states the maximum deposit yearly is fifteen thousand. Is that incorrect? Um, I thought it was. I am. You know what? That's the kind of thing I will check. But oh, maybe it went up. You know what? It may have gone up. It was fourteen thousand a year, and maybe it went up, and I and I wasn't aware. So that's a small increase, and that that could well be. I will, you know, these questions will all be answered in a follow-up mail email. What is it? Why is there a transfer penalty for going into a nursing home? <laughs> well, you can ask Congress, but uh, that's been on the books for you know. 20 or 30 years. 
because Medicaid doesn't want people transferring assets and then going on Medicaid to have the government pay for expensive care like nursing home. They want you to use your assets to pay for nursing home care. So by penalizing a transfer, they're making you use your assets. Um, there are strategies around minimizing that penalty, which would be for another training and private elder law attorneys specialize in that. So, but that's the policy behind it. Does cash value from a life insurance policy count as income? Um, cash value from a life insurance policy counts as an asset, not income. So, the the cash value the for both SSI and Medicaid, the maximum balance is uh, $1,500 at the time of application. So if that, if the cash value rises after the application, that's okay, it's exempt, it's allowed to increase. But if when you apply the cash value is 3,000 and you have other assets using the regular asset limit of the 15,000 um, and change, then you have excess assets and if 15,450 now um, you either have to take a loan out of that life insurance policy to reduce the cash value or cash it in. All right let's see one more question here and then we are closing. Let's see. If a person under 65 with disabilities wants to work but needs Medicaid to maintain personal care eligibility, can she put the excess income from the job for the month into a first party trust? Uh, yes, generally yes, that's the whole point. But, um, you know, in another training, and maybe I'll send out the link, there's also the Medicaid buy-in for working people with disabilities that you'd want to use in that case. Um, so there are lots of tricks to reducing the spend down and we have a recent article on our website um, which is this special Medicaid income rules that eliminate your spend down or surplus income and one of the key ones this takes you through a, a flow chart of different questions and one of them is do they have earned income because if so there is a great earned income disregard for anyone 65 or over or disabled and there is the wonderful Medicaid buy-in for working people with disabilities which increases the income limit and asset limit so I'll send out the link for this but you definitely um, so because there, there might not be a spend down but it is now 3.30, so we are going to close the webinar, and uh, you have the materials already for next time. If you want to review them in advance, we will review the questions, and if there are uh, questions that we're not going to answer at the next webinar, I will either send out an email after this webinar or wait till after part two and answer the questions then. So I thank you for joining us. And the webinar is now finished. Thank you.